right, yeah. this meeting of the Historic District Commission will take place in a webinar format through Zoom. The chair of the commission is Sarah Moriarty. Host of the webinar is the building official. Staff attending this meeting include Peter Zavinguis and Linda Galetta. Anyone speaking should state their names prior to speaking each time. The panelists in this webinar meeting will be the commission members and the building staff. Panelists who would like to comment on an item should indicate such by using the icon to raise hand at the bottom of the screen. After a panelist raises their hand, they will be able to comment one at a time when called upon by the chairperson. Panelists should mute their microphones until called upon. Panelists calling into the meeting by telephone may raise and lower their hand by pressing star nine. To mute or unmute your calls, press star six. To make a motion or second a motion, commission members can raise a hand and be acknowledged by the host or chair. To vote on a motion, commission members will be called upon individually by the chair to vote. The public can participate in the meeting during the public communications agenda item. The public will be asked to raise their hand during public communications if they want to speak at this time by using the icon to raise hand at the bottom of the screen. The public will be called upon by the host one at a time will be able to speak during this time. Attendees must identify themselves before speaking. Thank you, Peter. So I will start this meeting at 7.02 on February 1. And I think the only sitting commission member we're missing, if I can see everybody right, is Eric, right? Correct. So I will appoint um, Bill in Eric's place for this evening. And I will call HDC 21-54, 20 Pearl Street, John McCarrick, owner applicant fencing. I didn't read my thing yet. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you I hear out of sorts. I'll go back. Go ahead, Todd. So there's no, there's no public. This is just a continuation. So there was no. Okay. Oh. Forget that. Perfect. I got to promote some panelists. I'm promoting some people that are in the attendees. Hang on a second. We'll bring them in. So are we up to my um, application? Is this Mr. McCarrick? Yes, it is. Yes, we are. You have the floor. Wonderful. Um, I, this is my second time with you for the fencing proposal. And the first time I went with vinyl and you said you would not accept that. So I did uh, send in another picture, which um, Linda Galati said she did load on the website, which uh, I actually don't see it. It's, it's, but it's essentially a red cedar, three foot high picket fence. And we're at this point in time, I'm just going to be doing the front of the yard and I'll come back to the commission for the backyard fence at a later date. Peter, I posted that um, at the very beginning of the- I see it right there, right? Can you no. see that? No, that's not, not what I sent over. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Let's see what was down there. I saw it earlier, because Linda gave us a notice that she posted it, and I, yeah. I did yeah, see I it. Saw it. I saw it too. Yeah, yeah, I know, I did talk to her today. Yeah. Is it, Peter, is it not down at the bottom after the minutes? No. The last page was this, just the uh, uh, minutes from the last meeting. Let's see. It was a separate email. Well, this, I don't know if you can see it. Is, is the picture that you should have received. Yes, that's what I had seen yeah. earlier. So, I'm just so trying it, to- it's, it's, a, it it's a three foot high. Um, it'll fairly, fairly closely match my neighbor's fence. And it's really just re to replace that uh, wooden fence that's just in the front right now and on the sides uh, on the left end. The north and south side of the property. Bear with me for just one minute. Peter, are you letting everyone into the meeting? Because I guess, are you just letting them in when they're called? I've tried to let everyone in. Some of them didn't pop in for some reason. 
All right, because I, I guess there are some other people trying to come in. I, I just got a message. I just tried promoting them to the panelists, and for some reason, they're not coming in. Yeah, I got a message that Susan Fisher at the museum is trying to get in. Peter, so, Peter, can I screen share? Yep. All right, hold on. I have 7,000 tabs open, so um, let me see if I can just get this one. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is what I believe was submitted that's earlier. Petra. That's that's the picture I sent over. Yes. Yes. This was just the email that went with it. Um, three foot tall fence. Rear fence will not be replaced at this time. And then this was the illustration. Exactly. Okay. And the reasons are because the fence, as the other photos I sent over, is fairly well deteriorating. Okay. So does do any of so i'm sorry i'm not being very articulate so this is just this fence in the front you're not doing either of the sides yeah oh. i'm gonna deal i don't know what we're gonna do with the backyard fence yet okay all right does does any of the um commission members have any questions or comments for mr mccarrick mm -hmm. No, the material is red cedar and it's going to look like that. That's yep. yeah, they'll, they'll okay. explain it yep. for me. Questions or comments? No. Okay. Yeah, I, I do have another question on an unrelated topic. Um, I have a propane tank in the back of the house along the driveway. And I'm going to move it to the back of the house on the north side of the house. So the driveway is on the south side. But I have to come to the commission. You can't see it from the road. We can't see it. You don't have to come to us. OK. OK, I'm just going to stop screen sharing and give it back to Peter. Bonnie, you're muted. You're still muted. I'm just saying, if you could see it from Gravel Street, you'd still have to submit it. No, I don't think you can because the garage behind us blocks the view from Gravel Street into okay. the backyard. Perfect. So does anyone have any other additional comments before we close this public hearing for Mr. McCarrick? No? All right, thank you. HDC 21-54 is closed. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Open public hearings on HTC 21-54, 20 Pearl Street. This was the application that we just saw. This was the addition of the fence across the front of the property. That's a three foot tall red cedar fence that we just looked at. Any questions or comments or motions? Bonnie, you're muted. I make a motion to approve this very beautiful fence. Okay. I second. All right, uh, all in favor, I'll do a roll call. Uh, Ferguson? Yes. Moriarty? Aye. Levinson? Aye. Dalt? Aye. Brady? Aye. The application is approved. All right, super, thank you. All right, thank yep. you. So yep. it doesn't look like we have any other public hearings. So if you guys don't mind, I'm just gonna jump off because I'm managing a few things. Is that all right? It's okay with me. That's all right. Uh, Todd, can you run the meeting? Okay. I was going to say, Todd, is somebody, you said you got a phone call from somebody who wanted to jump in? Yeah, there, well, I know there's a bunch of names at the bottom. Uh, Susan Fisher from the museum um, contacted Rodolfo, and Rodolfo said she couldn't get in. She was trying to get in. All right. I'm going to step out, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Be well, Sarah. Thanks. The only the only person that I for some reason I keep trying to promote the panelists and won't come on is Kate J. That's the I only keep, one who won't, won't come on. I keep clicking for promoting to panelists and for some reason they're not going there. So I don't know if they're just on the phone. Somebody's raising their hand though. Hang on a second. There's a lot of people on there. Where the, Bill where the, oh. Bill Let's see if I can get him to ask them mute. 
Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, it's Bill Birchie. Oh. Uh, this is for a preliminary hearing. All right, hang on, hang on, Bill. Yeah. So you're not, you don't have any video, right, Bill? Uh, well, I have video, I'd like to share a screen, share a screen. Okay, so we don't have any order, uh, Peter, we don't have any order on these pre apps, right? Nope, there's, it's first come, first serve. <laughs> well, and, and all right. Um, all right, Bill, go ahead. Stay well, if, if, can you, can you on, this is for 17 Gravel Street. Uh, could you unmute uh, Dan and Chris for not and Brian, Brian, Brian Kent? All right, hang on a second. Let me see. Dan, okay. I asked him to unmute. Who else? Chris for not and Brian. All right. Chris for not right there. Actually, he's unmuted right now. Yeah, Brian's unmuted. Brian's unmuted too. Oh, they're all good. Okay, so can I share the screen? Yep. We'll click that, try that. Um, hmm. Oh, share. Oh, what do I do here? Your screen sharing. Uh, do you see this? Yes. Yes. 17 gravel? Yes. Uh, can you see the arrow moving around the text? Yes. Yeah. All right, good. So if I can point to things. You're just Possibly. you're just not maximized, Bill. Um, I don't know if that's you, but well, it's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. Well, I have a big screen. <laughs> oh, I got you. Hang on. A little better. Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. Um, so, Seventeen Gravel Street. Uh, you don't often get a chance to get a streetscape photograph like this. <laughs> uh, got across the river. And we came about last March, we came uh, before the commission and talked about renovating uh, this house, which would be substantial improvement. And the first floor elevation of the house is elevation nine. And it's in a flood zone where the base flood elevation is 11. And on the shoreline, if this was new construction, substantial improvement, uh, we would have to, we would be requested to raise the first floor to a foot above the base flood of eight elevation, basically elevation 12, which is be three foot higher than the house is right now. Which and, house are you talking about? Uh, the one right above the gravel. bracket, 17. This one right oh. under the, got it? Yep. Um, so it, it is possible to appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a waiver of flood regulations for historic houses. But given the investment to renovate the house, fix up the additions and what have you, uh, it seemed like a better plan to raise the house up three feet. Um, and you know, we had a discussion of just structurally, uh, how would we do that? And we suggested that we can document the house, the existing house, basically remove it and then rebuild it three feet higher. Uh, it would be structurally sound against the winds and last another 150 years. Uh, it's gonna be a challenge with all the historic houses that are- And you have another one that goes with the new house. Yeah. Right. So anyway, so this house here, and basically the project, be remove the house and this little garage in the back, uh, that's right against the sideline rebuild the house on a raised foundation with additions and an attached garage to meet FEMA regulations. And then also add an accessory dwelling unit and an in-ground pool with a security fence. Uh, so we'll have- Who's this this be? Who's assistant Dan Grace? Oh, this is- The okay. chair guy. Yeah. The chair guy, thanks. Uh, so we're <laughs> put on that. Okay, so um, let's see. This is- Closer up is what the house looks like. Uh, to the left is the garage that would be totally removed. Uh, the house would be taken down, new foundation built, raised up and, and, and rebuilt. But you'll see we've documented what the house is. 
On the rear of the house, you can see you have this very low slope roof addition, uh, and you'll see how we handle that. Uh, we did get an A2 survey, so we've got the elevations, uh, the house footprint, the garage is this garage here. You can see it's right against the line. Uh, and the house uh, is a little beyond the setback line on the north side here. It's just canted a little bit. It's not quite square to the property line. Uh, so based on that A2 survey, we, we basically did this, that the red line, well, does it help me to move my finger here? Uh, the red line here is the outline of the existing house. Uh, we took this corner and we rotated the house a little bit counterclockwise just to make it parallel to the property line. Uh, so the existing is 3.21 feet from the line, uh, but by rotating it, we could get a uniform, you know, seven, 7.2 feet across the back. Uh, in general, you can see we made those front uh, bays a little smaller, uh, and we'll go through the details of this. We did add an addition, added space on the first floor towards the rear, uh, added a little to the addition back here, added a covered porch in the back. Uh, we have a covered breezeway connecting to the garage. The garage is totally within the setbacks, uh, and then accessory dwelling unit. Uh, if, if you haven't run up against that, it needs to be uh, less than 800 square feet uh, living space measured uh, to the inside of the walls, we, we talk, uh, but it's basically a guest, guest house. Uh, so this is, this is basically what it looks like, uh, you know, a lot of work and rendering and, and, and getting it in through Photoshop. Uh, this is really the, the same house. Uh, well, we, we, you know, we added some dormers on the front, uh, raised up the uh, three feet. And to compare that, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just go through this sort of quickly, fundamentally what's changed is what strikes us as, are these large protruding bays on the existing house. Uh, which looked a little too large to us. And they, they're five-sided. You have these straight sides that come out. So one, two, three, four, five sides. We took these straight sides out and pushed the angled bays back against the house. We just thought that looked a little better in here. Uh, and we had, we tried different types of roofs on top of them, but we kind of found by taking this porch roof, uh, bringing it out and bringing it across the bays, uh, that looked best to us, you know, it seemed. Uh, so that's sort of how we treated, dealt with the bays. Uh, there's a minor thing, we'll get into details. We added some side lights to the front door uh, instead of the front door here. Um, they, they, we were developing the second floor, uh, so they wanted a little more access to the river. We, the peak is unique. It's kind of a characteristic of this house, so we saved save this same peak uh, and we just flanked it with some shed dormers, uh, you know, try to not to be too, too uh, in your face about a second story. Didn't want it to look like two stories. Uh, back here, you could see where you, you had the flat addition from the rear addition coming into the house. And we made those roofs the same pitch as the main house uh, with dormers. Uh, you'll see this a little more in other 3D pictures. Uh, to make things look a little more at ease. Uh, the, there is a stone, and building up, we have a stone patio here in front. Uh, and since that's just for safety, we put a three foot railing around here. So this is a new design element, this railing across the front here. Um, to, to get an idea what it would look like if you're looking down the driveways, we talked about this, this front, uh, we pushed the dormer, pushed the base back, brought the porch roof out here, added the dormers to either side. And you can see now we have a steeper roof uh, with a dormer. This is the rear addition that was sort of that flat addition. Uh, and to make these peak work, peaks work, we raised this main roof, uh, went up a couple of feet. And that brought this, this eave line visually. And it was interesting when we had this roof lower and the eave line disappeared, it, it just didn't look right. You lost the whole personality of what the, what the house was. 
uh, so to maintain the look of the house, we, we had done that. So looking up the driveway, it's the same driveway. Um, the windows are a little more uniformly spaced. This is the garage in the back. And this way back here is the uh, accessory dwelling unit and that's Pearl Street back there. That lot goes all the way through to Pearl Street. Uh, if you're to the north of the house, uh, it's, it's pretty, well, it's about seven feet. Uh, and we just made the windows a little more uniform. Probably all you'd really see is this side of the house and this fence is around the pool and Brian Kent will address the fences, uh, you know, things like that. How we handled the back, you can see here's that back addition on the house uh, with the dormers, here's the back porch. Uh, we added a, a covered porch on the, on the rear and the garage back here, which has sort of a, uh, office studio uh, in that. So things that you like are the elevations uh, and we can, I'll try to zoom in here. You can see this dark black line, that's the top of the existing first floor. That's the first floor of the house now. The base flood elevation, that's elevation nine. The base flood elevation from FEMA maps uh, is elevation 11, that's the blue line. And then the codes for uh, the town of Groton zoning code and the international residential code and FEMA all say they want the top of the first floor to be a foot above this base flood elevation in this uh, A zone. So that's, you can see that's right, that's the floor level right at, right at the door. Uh, so just note what I talked about was this railing for the stone porch here. Uh, in, in two places, we reduced the size of the bays, left and right. Um, we extended the porch roof to cover the bays, and we added side lights to the front door, put these dormers on the two sides of, of the ex existing gable, made this two windows here, but we spread them apart. It's not like you, these are not two windows you buy them all together. They're like six, six to eight inches apart. These are probably six, and I think these are eight down here. Uh, and then we raised the main roof up so it could intersect well with the back addition and, and we could see the gable here. Um, and then, well, we rebuilt this whole rear addition with a gable roof and dormers. Um, so let me go back to, okay, you still with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Some, sometimes, you know, I, things work for me and nobody says, I don't see what you're doing. Uh, well, actually, we'll go back to this. So the Southern, the southern I keep moving my hand away so you can see. Uh, here's the Southern, uh, what the Southern neighbor sees. You can see it's a lot more uniform, classic. Uh, the building height is really only 26 feet. Uh, this is the east elevation of the garage. You could, from the street, you could only really see this corner of the garage because the rest of it's hidden by the house. Um, let's see. That was that one. Okay, so what we've done is taken the existing house and worked out the details you can see for these rake boards. They have a crown molding up here, you know, and then the uh, rake board and, you know, uh, fascia here. So basically, we'd work out this detail to exactly match what that is. So, so that's what the house would be. If you look at this detail with the gutters, what it's really there is there's a wooden gutter. This is, this is a, you know, must be a cedar gutter in here that they sort of covered it up. Uh, so we'll create that. Either we'll actually put gutters under there or create the illusion with a crown molding uh, that this is a gutter sticks out and a little, little piece of, co-molding in here. And then again, this uh, 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 gable end and then the trim, you see the decorative trim. So all that'll be documented to match the existing house. The quarter boards was really nothing elaborate of the skirt board. They're just sort of five quarter by six boards uh, with a skirt board here. And this detail here <laughs> basically says the clapboard uh, we'd like to use just the hardy board, four inch clapboard, cement board, finish, uh, factory finished. 
uh, the window casing would be boral trim, five quarter by four solid. Window sills are, are two inches by um, whatever this depth is, boral trim. Door casing and uh, again, boral five quarter uh, by three and a quarter. Corner boards and the skirt boards would be five quarter by, uh, by six for the corner boards. Now, to get a stone, well, well, we'll talk about the stone about stone finish on the next page. Um, so the windows we're, we're thinking of either Anderson A series. So I just put an A series, which is a fiberglass exterior in a wood interior, or an E series, Anderson E series, which is aluminum clad with an exterior in a wood trim, uh, with a modern divided light. So we'd have the double glazing and the wood mutton bars on the inside and the uh, Aluminum or the fiberglass mutton bars on the outside with a spacer bar uh, to give it sort of that authentic look. As we look at the center gable, really, if you look carefully, there's you have this shingle pattern, and that's the one place we'd like to just do that with a straight edge underneath the shingles. We like the shingles, but not the owner doesn't care for the up and down things. And then, and we've re, re, we'll reproduce this uh, hatched uh, panel above the window. Uh, you know, that's sort of what makes Mystic Houses, Mystic Houses, where little builders did stuff. Uh, one of the comments from the historic uh, archives of the house are these pilasters, which are sort of tapered next to the front door. So we duplicate those next to the door uh, in the paneling between, between the bays. Uh, there's round columns on the porch. These would be round with fiberglass and the uh, railings here. Uh, would be uh, either ASEC trim, PVC ASEC trim painted and finished or, or a borrow. Um, if we go, no, I'm gonna just, go just, Bill, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, go ahead. on these either or, you're gonna have to make a decision and when you come to your public hearing. Oh, okay, all right, good. Well, we can, I, we, we'll okay. talk with the owner okay. on that. Uh, now I talked about the stone veneer and this is the detail up here where the skirt board will stick out uh, about three inches, you know, with a little water table. But again, only only be about a, a two by eight piece of trim. And then you, you can get cut stone veneer and this uh, Delgado thin stone veneer actually has a Connecticut blend, which are is sort of the blues and browns of Connecticut granite. The worst you can do with stone veneer is, oh yeah, we get this stone in Kansas all the time, you know, and that's not what we want to put on the house. So the key is the, is is to get this, and with their mosaic pattern, it's a little more random, uh, you know. If, if we go with 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 a really uh, geometric rectangular shapes, they'll, they'll just be too small. It wouldn't look like like the foundation. So that's the recommendation there. Uh, next to the garage, I, when I get back to a site plan, uh, we do have a full house generator. It's in the middle of the site, but it has to be up uh, 12 feet, elevation 12 feet down here also. Uh, and then this is just a detail. There are along the roadway, and Brian Kent will talk about that. There is a, a stone wall now and with some steps that go up into the yard. Uh, this is just a detail of the stepping up. Remember I said there was a new railing that you'd see on the stone por patio porch. Uh, this is the detail of the railing, uh, boral trim with, with horizontal clapboard. Uh, it would sit up here and then there's a garden that's down two feet uh, for shrubs and then another drop. So we just don't get a four foot high stone wall. Uh, just detail the stone steps. Um, just because I think they're required, um, floor plans for the house and, and garage, first floor, second floor. And if you look at the roof plans, which you can see clearly is here's the, you know, sort of the big peaked front house with the porch. This is the porch roof coming around. And then this is the addition, peaked addition coming, coming into it. And this is the rear porch. Uh, and then you have the garage. Uh, and it was interesting. Uh, you were looking at 20 Pearl Street, you know, for an application. Well, the back of the lot, 17 Gravel Street, this fronts on Pearl Street, which is here. 
uh, and to the right is Pearl, 20 Pearl Street, and to the left is 26 Pearl Street. And the water a couple of weeks ago probably got up to just about here <laughs> when Pearl Street got, got uh, and that was just, uh, you know, storm surge coming in here. Uh, so just to repeat there, we're now talking about over here, the accessory dwelling unit, Pearl Street. Uh, the idea is that we'd have a driveway entrance here with, 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 with maybe one parking space to drop off groceries and stuff. Uh, the main parking back here and, and along here. Uh, and then the driveway would still be up here coming, coming across here. Um, so the dwelling sits here. There is a raised stone patio here in the back and a raised wood deck. Uh, this is what we uh, designed for that. It, it's sort of this raised summer over the summer kitchen. We've seen that where you have a lower story. Now, in fact, this is only five and a half foot headroom in here, uh, but that, that can meet FEMA standards, no problem. But we think it gives it the look of the kind of houses that you see uh, in, in Mystic. Not many of the houses along Pearl Street are raised. And this, this, this is just meets code uh, with the first floor at 12 feet. Uh, but so that's the porch. Um, this is the back patio. And actually, if you can look on down, there's a river out the right side. Um, so is that is that first lower level, is that really just sort of like a, a glorified crawl space? Yeah, it's a glorified crawl space, but you can put your lawn furniture in and your kayak and your lawnmower and you know things like that always bicycles riding around uh things fema lets you do that you know it's not finished in any way it's not heated it's just uh maybe dehumidified um so really the backyard mostly what you might see is a bit of this patio from gravel street up you'd be looking up the drive and you'd see the corner of this patio. So the garage doors for for the garage are facing Pearl Street. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was why I, you know, I showed sort of the back of the uh, um, the this, as you say, this this garage faces Pearl Street, but the accessory dwelling units between the garage and Pearl Street. Uh, so to just complete, you know, we're provide elevations. These are the detailed elevations. It's actually not so high, 16 feet. It's actually small. It's only 800 square feet, one story. Uh, so that's the west elevation. This one faces the Pearl Street. Um, east elevation, that's what faces uh, 20 Pearl Street. Uh, the details are pretty much the same. We want to use the same uh, stone veneer on the outside. Uh, we probably have the same type of trim. I, I think that's probably important. So it not look like something, oh, they just threw that up there and put the aluminum gutters on. There will be gutters, but they'll hang on gutter straps out here. Um, uh, it's the same details here. And we'll pick which windows that we want here. Um, and just in terms of maybe you can see it, here's the floor plan. There's obviously just the main roof, main living space, and just a one bedroom over here, bedroom, and just one here, big open space. And then this, this being a crawl space in here. Um, so is, is Brian Kent active? There was a Brian on there, is he? We have audio from yeah. him. Yeah, I'm here, Bill. Uh, so this I've been quietly lurking in the background. Oh, quietly. Okay, so you're gonna cue me on. So uh, we're working with uh, Kent Frost, uh, landscape architects, to deal with all of the outside uh, furnishings and things that that HTC would 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 be concerned about. So Brian, you can go ahead. Okay, Bill. Thank yeah. you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Kent, um, uh, Principal Landscape Architect with Kent and Frost Landscape Architecture located in Mystic. And this is, um, I think, the third or fourth um, residence on uh, Gravel Street that we've worked on. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, 
later in my presentation of some previous work that relates to what is proposed for this site. And on this site, you know, you've you've heard Bill describe how the uh, the structures are organized from uh, Pearl Street across to to gravel, and uh, you know what currently exists is basically an empty lot on the Pearl Street side. And by tying the uh, the two um, the streets together uh, in a in a you know a simple circulatory system, we're creating a a a, a driveway uh, 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 route for for the owners' vehicles, but we're we're making it circuitous so that it's not a straight shot or doesn't doesn't look or appear and or feel like an alleyway. We're also we're also uh, minimizing the width of the driveway to just what is necessary. So the driveways are only 10 feet wide. And, um, and then they're, they're surrounded wherever possible by, by landscaping to minimize their, their, you know, their, their exposure. And the material for the driveway that we're considering at this point is, is um, uh, uh, modular pavers. So, so you know, you're familiar with these brick-like concrete interlocking pavers, but in this case, we're we're hoping to use permeable pavers so that the the uh, the storm water that falls on the pavement can be absorbed into the underlying um, sub uh, soil strata, preventing it from from uh, running down the driveway ends onto the streets, exacerbating the the you know the occasional flooding that's going on. So, so we're going to be looking at the soil. Uh, capacity to absorb water here and, and looking at ways that we can improve upon that. So starting on, um, I'll just give you a, uh, what I'm going to do is this overall um, uh, overview, and then I'm going to zoom in on uh, gravel, uh, gravel Street first, then the center area encompassing the garage, and then we'll move over to, to Pearl Street. So so on the on the gravel side, the driveway is uh, basically existing where the existing driveway is. No change there, except that you know it'll be it'll be a little bit narrower, and it'll be a paver material, <clears throat> and uh, so it'll run up along the side of the house just like it does today. There'll be a, uh, a little pull-off parking area for the re uh, the occupants so they can get out of their car, um, unload groceries, and uh, be, not not block the driveway. Uh, and then it continues around into the into the uh, garage parking courtyard area. And this is the largest expanse of pavement on the on the site, but it's also obscured and, and really screened from from both sides, from gravel and from Pearl Streets by the building. So you're not really looking at a, into this parking area. You can't really see it um, except around the edges. And uh, so this is where we make this chicane. And then we, we, we switch from the south, um, uh, from, from this one side of the site to the, to the north side of the site and around the accessory building dwelling and, and then out onto, onto, onto Pearl. And so that's the, the general layout. Um, I did not mention, but um, between the garage and the main house, there's a small courtyard area with a, with a swimming pool, relatively small compact swimming pool. And that area is entirely um, obscured from either roadway. So it's very private and, um, and, and enclosed there. So Bill, can you advance the next slide, please? So here we're looking at the, the Gravel Street frontage, and the first thing to talk about is the, the existing stone retaining wall. And this is part of a streetscape that continues basically the all but entire length of Gravel Street. There are some interruptions, but most of the properties on Gravel Street have a have a stone retaining wall. And this is that that old hand quarried granite. Um, you know, they're 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 they're, they're blocky cubular pieces that are different lengths. And some of them may have been derived from uh, other building foundations. Um, they certainly have the same size and heft as building foundations. And the, this existing house um, on this site has quite a bit of the same stone in its foundation. And we're thinking about ways that we might be able to reuse some of that old foundation stone which of course will be replaced by a you know a, a 
a modern structural concrete foundation uh, veneered in stone as, as Bill described it. So we'll have a surplus, we'll have salvaged stone that comes out of the, the, um, the construction. And so one thought is to use that stone to um, reinforce and, and uh, you know, rebuild to a more structural uh, capability of this existing wall and also perhaps to use it depending on how much we derive in, in some of the other uh, walls on the site. So it'd be really um, uh, appropriate if we can if we can utilize site stone, original, you know, local quarry granite stone that was um, used to build many of these houses, foundations in this, in this site. And that's that's our that's our goal and objective in this case. Uh, the stairs that are on the site, you see you see a set of steps up from the street. Right now that existing stairway is very narrow. It's about three feet wide. So it feels very crimped. What we what we propose to do is widen it to more like four feet. And then to put in a very generous stairway of granite steps up to the, the main porch. Another opportunity to use the local salvaged granite. And in this um, in the first terrace area that's just above the street level, it's really just a simple landscape. Uh, it's a functional landscape. So it's principally lawn and uh, perhaps a, a fringe of low shrubbery against the back of the wall. This was this has been done on, on several of the other houses along Gravel Street. And then the, um, the next set of stairs going up onto the main porch uh, with planters flanking either side would have just a, you know, another simple kind of landscape uh, element uh, in, in there. So we're not covering up the stonework with shrubbery. You know, we're, we're leaving it open to, to view so that the character of that of that you know quality material uh, is is um, perpetuated for the, the you know the for the property. Another thing that though that is important to the to the owner and to um, kind of controlling the um, the traffic that that um, is is on Gravel Street, especially in in tourist season where people are. Or driving around and trying to figure out where to go, and they often they often turn around in this driveway. So so it's just a it's just an open space, and 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 the owner has observed on many occasions people who are just trying to figure out where to park turn into the driveway, and um, and so to to provide more security to the site, more more um, uh, especially for for. Um, kids that might be in the driveway, uh, grandchildren that might be in the driveway in this case, we're proposing a, a wrought iron type gate, a single leaf gate that would fold against the existing fence that runs between the properties, um, fold back against that and could, could span across the, the entire driveway connected to granite posts uh, like the like the the existing granite posts on Gravel Street. In fact, there's one almost in this exact location that we could we could be right um, um, behind. That is a it's a it's an existing um, hitching post, and that would be the latch points for for the gate. But most of the time, I think um, uh, it it could be it could be um, more transparent than say a white. Uh, picket type fence. We were thinking black wrought iron, wrought, wrought iron at this point to minimize its appearance, but to tie in with the, the style of uh, wrought iron historic fencing. So that's the that's the front area. That's the gravel street frontage and its um, and it and its design. And now we'll move into the center of the site. So uh, next slide please. So this is the swimming pool courtyard primarily and the um, the, the, the way that the garage and the house uh, kind of and the breezeway bracket, the pool area is much, um, much more private. There would be a pool fence enclosure along the north side of the breezeway and it would wrap around um, and give the pool its code compliant enclosure. Now on the north side property line, there is existing a variety of, of just a patchwork of old uh, a decrepit fencing you know some of them are just completely disintegrating up there and what we're 
uh, proposing to do is to is to just standardize that that property line enclosure with a with a fence line that would be uh, at least in the swimming pool area would be a full height six foot uh, tall solid uh, privacy fence and um, and then it it either continues um, or steps down, but there's really uh, on the on the properties to the north where we're up against garages and, and outbuildings. So we're really not uh, up against a um, a full time dwelling until we get out to to um, uh, Pearl Street. So we're also tucking in next to the generator. We would have pool equipment in a in a in a small enclosure. So the generator and the pool equipment would be more or less in the same kind of utility enclosure. Uh, there would be a a lower picket fence there, just just enough to to um, uh, get a, to to secure it. That that would be visible. The the mm, west side of the generator fence that uh, uh, Bill. Uh, uh, depicted in some of his renderings, that would be visible. But that would, of course, just be a, a, a low three to three and a half foot white picket fence. So now let's move to the next slide, please. So here you can see the accessory dwelling, the driveway. Uh, there would be a curb cut on Pearl Street. Um, you've got a very wide sidewalk there. It's about an eight foot wide sidewalk and it's just an irregular shape that happens to be the, um, the, the property line. So, you know, the, the, the right of way lines are just all over the place in these, in these neighborhoods. They, they, they weren't really laid out with, with right of way in mind. They just happened to, to just zig and zag a little bit. So this is one of those places where the, the, the sidewalk is very wide until it, until it gets just north of this, of this property and then it steps in again. So it, it, it zags back into Pearl Street just above this property line to become a more uh, normal width uh, sidewalk. So, so here we would, we would have this curb cut. And um, you, know, you saw in Bill's slide, and Bill, I don't know if you wanna jump to it, but you don't really have to. I think on, on your slide 16 was the, the street view of Pearl Street, and you you recall there was there's really just one long white picket fence about three and a half feet high, just a standard uh, uh, three to three and a half inch wide picket vertical, and what we propose to do is put the same type of fence back so that we have continuity with the existing condition, uh, with the exception that each at each of these um, endpoints and at you know at these driveway and the walkway, uh, we're 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 considering granite posts. Uh, to give it just to give it a more substantial endpoint, and in in the areas around the house, this this dwelling and the driveway, they would just be would just be relatively low and simple landscaping. So so we're not um, not proposing anything really major in that regard. We are um, providing uh, a bluestone terrace attached to the house on the south side of the house. Um, that connects down to just a few steps down onto the driveway. And, and really all of the walkway paving that's connected to the driveway would be the same permeable pavers. Next slide, please. So if, uh, if you start in the top left, this is a, this is a wrought iron gate. Um, at a residence at the corner of, of Gravel and Eldridge. Uh, this was a project that we worked on a few years ago and we worked with a local um, uh, blacksmith to uh, fabricate that, that gate. So this gate that we're proposing is considerably larger, not necessarily taller, but it would be something along the lines of a simple wrought iron uh, fence is structural enough to span the width of the driveway. Excuse um, me, Brian, Brian, can I just jump yes. in real quick? Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Dan. Um, I, I don't want to minimize this. I, I think the, the, the issue at hand here, besides other streets along gravel, is that our driveway uh, is right next to the Rodriguez's driveway right next door. So it creates this huge opening as someone's driving by to turn around. Uh, if we're sitting there on whatever the Adirondacks chairs or just sitting out enjoying you know, the afternoon or whatever, it's, it's, you know, 15, 18, 20 times an hour. Like this is not, you know, once or twice, just so you understand the, uh, 
you know, the frequency of it, it's people turning around all day. And even our friends and neighbors are like, geez, what's going on? I'm like, hey, it's just the way it is at the moment. But so I just wanted to, uh, to just put that in there. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, thanks for underlying that issue. So it does need a gate. And, uh, you know, the objective is a, a, you know, a very attractive appealing gate, ideally made by a local artisan. So that ties it all together. Now, the, 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 the other uh, piece of the frontage um, historic um, pattern of the gravel streetscape is the stone wall. And to the right, the next photo you see down at the end, this is again the same property at uh, the corner of Eldridge, uh, where, where these, these, these walls um, over you know, decades and generations, they tend to uh, loosen up, uh, you know, water gets in the joints and they, they may not have been built that um, uh, structurally secure to begin with. And they need to be uh, re -put, just put back together and reinforced so that they can stand there for, for another 150 years. And so that's what we've done um, on, on both of the projects uh, on, on, on Gravel Street that we've worked on is we've, we've basically put these walls back together. We've added to them where necessary. You know, we filled in the, the broken pieces with new pieces and, um, and made them whole again. And that's, that's, what, um, that's what we propose to do here. Uh, the next set down are fencing. Uh, we, you know, we're talking about a, a, a stout wooden privacy fence. Um, this is something that, again, will last um, for a long time. Uh, not, not something that's that's flimsy and 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 um, artificial. The the type of picket fencing we're talking about, again, very stout and substantial. Uh, uh, more like what's there today, but I am showing a photo of a project that is um, on the corner of Pearl and Star Street uh, that we worked on a number of years ago. And more, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of uh, construction materials that we're talking about, just stout, um, uh, uh, real wood, um, uh, uh, coated stain, white stain. And then uh, the next inset photo there is a granite uh, post with a fence attached to it, just to give you a sense of what that might look like. And then moving on to paving, we'll finish with a uh, uh, discussion of paving. So for the areas of driveway, we're looking for a type of paver that is um, that is a gray granite type color scheme so that it uh, blends in with the, with the masonry, but has joints that are um, about a quarter to three eighths of an inch wide filled with chip stone that allow water to infiltrate. So in a, in a relatively flat site like this, you get the most, um, uh, po the best possible infiltration of, uh, of rainwater into permeable paving. So this is an ideal site for permeable paving. It doesn't work as well on sloping driveways because water can run across pavers and not have as much of an opportunity to soak in. But this site is really ideal. And that's what we're aiming for on the driveway areas. And then on some of the, you know, the terraces and the porches, we're looking at something more like the bluestone in the, in the next photo to the right. Um, and the you can also see in that photo the, 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 the wide stairway, the granite stairs, that's similar to what we're proposing with, a, with a, a wrought iron type railing. And this particular house, um, also designed by um, Mercer, Birchie Vernot and uh, Ken Frost Landscape Architecture, included just a similar arrangement of stone steps, a, a blue stone the porch at the living level, and then stone uh, veneer uh, planter walls. And so that ties it all together with the old stone and the new stone and, uh, and the landscape. And um, so that's where I finish up. And uh, I think at this point, Bill, I'll hand it back to you. Um, th thank you for your attention. OK. Uh, uh, Dan Grace, the owner, would, did you have any other sort of comments? Uh, maybe we'll just go back to this. Dan? Yep. Uh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get my, I don't know who can, can you guys see me? I'm, I'm, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, no, thank you both uh, Bill and Brian. Uh, thanks to the commission as well. Uh, no, I just want to stress that, that obviously there's been a lot of um, time and effort here to, to bring together the, uh, you know, the sort of, I say obvious, but need for the FEMA regulations. I, I don't think I'm the first, I'm certainly won't be the first. 
uh, to deal with this uh, in, in these times. Um, but obviously, I love the area. I, I want to do what's right. I'm very uh, willing to uh, to work with everyone. Um, I hope we've maintained the uh, the essence of things. I, I certainly do look to repurpose what we can. Uh, Brian talked about some of the granite stuff. We also have a lot of brownstone, a lot of uh, bluestone things on the property that we can uh, intermix with the uh, with the things as well. Um, these guys did a great job presenting it. I, I don't want to ruin the presentation uh, by talking. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> other than I, I just I can assure you, um, you know, this 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 isn't going to get halfway and, and unfinished. Um, it's it's properly funded uh, and, and, and we will bring it to completion um, quickly, um, you know, given the, the approvals that we need. Uh, so so those are our goals. Uh, and I just I thank you again for your time. So does okay. the commission have comments. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Does anyone on the commission have any comments about any or all aspects of this? I, I have some questions. Sure. Yeah, this is John Goodrich. So I just want to be clear because maybe I'm not understanding the words. What's going to happen to the historic house that's on there now? It, it basically, I guess you could say it'd be demolished. I'm going to say that officially because I think part of the historic uh, permit has to approve demolition of historic houses. Right. Okay, that, that's what I thought. It just wasn't clearly said. So I, I wanted to be clear. So we're basically tearing down the almost 200 year old home and the new one will be new construction. Is that correct? Correct. And, you know, we, we tried to document it as much so we can rebuild it as it, as it was. Okay. And just a question, we talk about permeability. I mean, they're using the permeable pavers, but covering up a lot of what's now open space. Have you guys done any type of study on how it's going to affect the neighbors as far as flooding? I mean, are, are we making it a less permeable situation? Brian? Well, I mean, it's, it is clear that there is going to be more per, uh, um, impermeable surface. That is, that is correct. You're absolutely right. And uh, so we're, the objective is to do as much as possible to infiltrate the, the water um, as possible. Um, the the, the um, additional measures that might be appropriate pending uh, some soil investigation is that roof water could theoretically be uh, uh, directed into infiltrators. Uh, but this all depends on doing some soil uh, uh, test pits to determine you know, what's going on with permeability of the soil, groundwater, that sort of thing. So we would like to be able to put um, as much water as possible into the ground on site. So that's, that is really the overarching goal. We just have to get a little further into the um, uh, uh, analysis of the existing conditions before we can say unequivocally that that is, that is feasible, but that, um, that is our goal. Yeah, and I think, Thank I think you. John, that, that, John, that's a good point to raise, but in the final analysis, that's a P and Z, uh, assuming you're gonna need P and Z approval for this, I assume, um, and that's an issue they have to address. In, in no, I, I get it, Todd, it's just more of a curiosity question for me. I think it's a good one, it's a yeah. good one. Oh, and uh, let me just bring up one other, uh, find a site plan here. Uh, in order to, I would say, maintain this location for the house, uh, we'll probably have to go to ZBA, Zoning Board of Appeals, and ask for the only variance is like right here on the side of the house. And we've, we had done this before with historic district properties where they said, come get the historic uh, certificate of appropriateness first, then go to ZBA. And then hopefully maybe we have a letter from the commission uh, urging that we'd like to keep the house in the same location uh, that it has historically been in. Uh, I'm a little unclear about the, uh, the driveway. Is the driveway on both sides of the property or could you just go over that again? Uh, the driveway is on the southern side. That's where it is now. It comes in here into this garage. So the driveway is there. And then this same driveway will go right to the, the garage and then we'll come out this side, come out past the fire plug on this side. So there's, not, there's none on the north side of the main house then? No, no. Yeah. Okay. And there's, there's none on the south side of of the accessory dwelling. We actually tried that, but we're just so tight against 20 Pearl Street, it would just be a canyon 
uh, kind of awful condition for that house. So we, we went this way. I have a question. Yep. Um, those permeable um, pavers, are the pavers themselves actually permeable? No, 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 no. The, it's the, That's it's in the, between. Okay. It's the interstitial space between the pavers. I have um, uh, three comments. One, I, I just so you know, I live on Pearl Street and I am an architect. I think that you have done, they've done a beautiful job of a new house that looks very similar to the historic house. But in just in general, I prefer to not take down historic houses. And did you look at reusing the existing house and, and modifying it and raising it? We haven't been, I, I, I'm also an engineer, I'm an architect and an engineer. Uh, hadn't been under it, but I've done so many houses and coastal flooding to really tie them down with the shear walls and stuff. You know, Brian referred to two other houses. We did uh, one at Pearl and Cliff Street and the other one up by Eldridge. And really every wall stud was taken out and put in new wall studs and every floor joist was changed. And if you look at the roof line, every rafter was changed. It's like every board in the house is changed. So it's not just a simple matter of, let's just jack it up three feet and, uh, work foundation underneath it. Um, it it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult decision. I understand this, <clears throat> excuse me. I was on the board many, many years ago and, and uh, there was an old foundation with a house falling down. And, but in that case, we turned the people down because they would come in and say, well, this is falling down. We want to demolish what's there and we want to build this other house. And in this case, we're not building another house. We're, we're you know, we're trying no, no, to- No, it's very rebuild, much in keeping with the house. Rebuild owner. what was there. And um, it's tough. I, I, it's a tough decision. And then my other comment is, I agree with uh, John's comment about the, the now very limited natural leftover grass and uh, space. So that, I, that, that is definitely a concern for me. And um, is 10 feet enough for, if you have to get an emergency vehicle, like a fire engine in to get to that middle garage? That's enough. Uh, yes. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they, they'll probably just pull the hoses in anyway. I'm only laughing because the garage next to my house burned down last year and <laughs> the fire trucks were all out in the street. They had long hoses. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, I, I, I think... You guys were in about this house must have been six, eight, nine months ago. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, initially, and um, and obviously now have ex expanded on your, your plans and whatever. I mean, I don't disagree with a lot of your comments about the feasibility of potentially jacking the house up. Um, and I also think that the house that the the existing front of the house is a little bit of a an architectural abortion. Excuse my language. Um, from the standpoint of what it actually looks like, historic or not, but the but the one thing that I would just caution you about, in my opinion, is that you make every effort possible, and I don't know if it is possible, to not make the thing look brand spanking new. And I don't know how exactly how you do that, but I think there is a danger that because it is in essence a new house, albeit copying a lot of the architectural features of the existing. That it could, it could impose itself on the neighborhood as a whole just because it is too new looking. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, yeah, I think it does, and I and I think, uh, you know, like over the years, we've sort of looked at that. Brian, Brian was right on the money. It's like if you can reuse as many, like like the stones and the materials. One of the I won't call it tricks of the trade is. New houses seldom do the level of trim that's on a historic house. And that was always the issue, always been an issue in a historic district. It's like, if these, if these corner boards are six inches and they're actually six inches, then we wanna put in six inch corner boards, not five and a half inch, uh, five quarter by six stock. So that's the importance of us measuring all the trim um 
you know, and, and I, you know, I think, I mean, we might even end up putting the wood gutters on, not you know, covering them up, not using them just to get that exact shape. Um, you know, things look new when you sort of take shortcuts in the trim and how you add gutters and things like that. Uh, it, it's to really understand how every board was, how thick it was, and to, to put that back. Uh, we may think through, from your comment, where we said the hardy board clapboards, now that you mentioned that, they might look a little smooth, like a little too finished. You can always tell a vinyl house when you drive by it, almost from, from a moving car, it's too clean. Years ago, we found out the actually the wood grain clapboards looked better because they got dirty, you know, and that you had a variation of, of things. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that because I know there's another product that we might consider. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the fact that 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 you have inserted the garage into the center of the the property um, is is a big improvement, so that you're not assaulted by garage doors from either of the two streets, which would be a, a way you, you have garage doors uh, facing uh, Gravel Street now. But I think that's an improvement. I will tell you that um, personally, I am not crazy about the view from Pearl Street of the house. Um, yeah, I, I just it. The house is better looking from the from the other side than it is from Pearl Street. I mean, the big porch and the and the the stair up. Well, I guess it, I guess it I guess it looks too much like the back of the house. I'm sorry, are, are you talking about the accessory dwelling or the, the yes or the accessory dwelling? Oh, all right, all right. I don't yeah. think I agree great, with that. A great straight street view. Gee, um, either is a client. <laughs> yeah. We'll work. We'll work. We'll work on that. Okay, because it, it, it but it, but you have that it, the difficulty is it's that you know the grades five feet and the first floor is twelve feet you know and twelve minus five seven feet how do you get people up there uh, you know in in a way well I think we didn't we want to put all the landscaping like we did on on Gravel Street because uh, the stepping up on Gravel Street is not unlike some of the other houses on Gravel Street uh, how their front yards are. Uh, right. But Pearl Street, everything's pretty much low and level. Um, but but you are you are forced to be up in the air anyway. I mean, I think you did a great job of stepping up, stepping up from uh, from Gravel Street, but in the back um, off of Pearl. I mean, you're going to be higher than the street, the houses next to you, no matter what you do. I'm exactly, and, and you know, I'm just not it, sure that the stair going up to the expansive deck. Um, I don't know. I, I take another look at that. Yeah, we will. Yeah, no, thank you. Yep. And I do sympathize with the owner having the cars turn around. And I like the gate better than the sawhawk horse option a little bit further down the street. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Maybe this isn't in our purview, but I'm just curious. I, did, I couldn't see. Um, the fine print. What's the current square footage and what's the new square footage? Um, I, just, I just can't read that. So. Um, existing floor area, this, you know, it's footprint, uh, 3,400 to 5,000, basically double. Yeah. Uh, but well, a big, well, there's uh the accessory dwelling is adding a thousand of that, more than a thousand, and the garage went from five hundred to nine eighty. House house is not much difference. The house went from seventeen hundred to two thousand, basically. The house only got about three hundred square feet. We added a back porch, which hadn't been there. Right. That's Front one porch. of the few houses. Few, few. I think it's the only lot really on. Pearl Street that didn't have a back house. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So. And and the breezeway is 400 square feet. So, wow, you know who's got 5,000 square foot house? But it's a lot of little different pieces. Not not so much. The main house actually is not much different in size. In in many of the houses that those lots are split right down the middle, and there's a full-size house on both 
one on pearl, one on gravel. So right, right. this is a lot less for on the pearl side because it's an accessory. Yeah. So. I mean, in the long run, houses in Pearl Street might get raised. I mean, just the reality of more and more of that storm floods coming through. There's one right across the street, the yellow house. Yeah. Um, that's that looks that looks raised to me. It's got the porch that's that's I mean a good five or six feet off the off grade. Uh, that might have been built after flood standards. That was actually built. Oh no, it wasn't. No, no. Take it back. No. Those three houses on Pearl that were put on that old uh, community center lot are all new and they're right. pretty high. Yeah. yeah. But some of the old house, I mean, my house is up, the main floor is way up from oh, the street yeah. level. I have like five or six steps up to my main level entry. Any, any other comments from the commission? No. Obviously we're gonna, we're gonna go through this, you know, all again when they come back for a public hearing. Could, could we schedule a public hearing, you think, or? That's really your choice, Bill. It depends how, what your level of confidence is in terms of what you presented thus far in the comments. Um, but yeah, that's, that's wholly your discretion. The next I mean, one's in two weeks. Yeah. I mean, that's what we prefer to do to get to this, the point they could actually build in good weather. <laughs> So can you can I just get a uh, to just an idea of the process for for those commission members that are not in attendance? Does this come back and does anything get like published with other with other comments or, or things like that that are proposed? You know, after this uh, pre application hearing. No, in, in essence, what is that Dan speaking? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, in, in essence, what happens is is you you come in for a preliminary like this, you get a certain amount of input from the commission. Um, none of it wholly dispositive in any respect or in yep. the indicative of how they, any of the members may or may not vote on the final application. Um, this is a hearing at which almost all the members are here, which is a good thing because, you know, attendance tends to vary a little bit. But in essence, what happens at the next, the next meeting, you come back with, with, based on the comments you've heard and your own feelings about the good and the bad and the things you may or may not want to change, you can come back for a public hearing at which point um, Bill and uh, and um, and Brian will have to go through the same presentation as though they had not presented anything to date. As, okay. As far as establishing a record, so this this hearing or this meeting doesn't establish any kind of a record of any kind whatsoever with regard to the final approval. So um, you come you come in, it's like a case de novo, and um, and you make your presentation, and then um, there would be additional comments, and and then it would be put to a vote. Okay, thank you. I mean, the only, the only piece that maybe would be new is how we handle the porch on Pearl Street. And, yeah. and the windows. And, and, and make and finalize oh, decisions on the oh, either. And then there's a lot of comment about the amount of, you know, hard skate. Maybe right, you look right. at that. I don't know. Yeah. Have you, have you talked to your neighbors, Dan? Um, yeah, let me go on here. Um, not, uh, let me start, I can start a video. Uh, yeah, the neighbors uh, directly to the south, the Rodriguez's, um, next door to them, uh, I guess his name is Travis to my, to my, to the north, uh, he's never there, he's there, you know, a week or two per year. Um, but ironically, um, when I was taking a lot of brush out, because I don't know if you guys remember the, the pictures I showed, whatever it was, eight months ago, where all that brush that, you know, I cleared out, and, um, you know, he sort of immediately, you know, called me with his landscape and he said, hey, you know, can I just like put up, you know, arborvitaes and some stuff like right there because we like our privacy and whatever. So so that sends a little message with respect to that that fence area on that side. Um, and then the neighbors, uh, you know, June and Brian across the way were, were, were more than happy. You know, he's up there. He's like, oh, we can go to the porch. I'm like, all right, slow down, Brian. Slow down. <laughs> but, <laughs> so. 
So, uh, yeah, I've, I mean, for, for the people that I've talked to, it's been full support. You know, I haven't shown them drawings and gone into all that. I've just say, hey, listen, here's what we're talking about. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, so I think, you know, look, if it's an improvement for the neighbors, you know, they're, they're not going to uh, they're not going to be against it from my perspective. And okay, if thank they you. are, they can come to the hearing. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, how do we apply for the hearing? Usually we do it right at the meeting. So. <laughs> You, you, you've got to fill out your application, you know, you haven't filled out an application yet. So you fill out the application bill and then you um, you basically have to provide all of your exhibits and everything. You can talk to Linda about that or to, um, um, sorry, his name. Just go to Tom, Tom Hall. Tom. Tom Zanarini, yeah. He is the one who sort of oversees this this um, submission of information. Um, and, and you can get the deadline so when you've got to have it in, but you, you know, it's not like when you used to be able to bring it to the meeting. Well, I, I know it's got to happen pretty quick because of their public notices and all. But that's right. I, I think, Linda, it's Thursday morning. Might might be. Yeah, this Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we would make them out at the meeting itself. That's why. Well, well, we'll talk. We'll talk to our, our Dan here, you know, see how he wants how we should proceed. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a, a fair amount to assimilate in a couple of days. Yeah. But again, that's that's on you. Yeah. You want to approach it. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Then we'll move along. I think the next um, the next one is the um, Mystic Museum of Art is here, and I have to recuse myself from this one. Um, so, Don, you want to take over? Sure. <laughs> Okay. The next most senior member of the commission. Unless Bonnie, unless Bonnie wants a shot. Well, oh, no, no, that's okay. You do it, Don. Yeah, she skipped. Right. She skipped some years, so uh, we don't know where she is in terms of seniority. Uh, Don, we have we have a hand raised in the audience. Okay. Paige Gulrick. I'm asking them to unmute. Let's see if you can. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, my husband and I are both architects and we bought a house in Mystic recently and we have been talking with Linda Galetta and Bruce Lofgren and we are here for a preliminary discussion of our project and I, we're novices so we're not quite sure how we, if this is the right time to speak. It's a pretty simple presentation. It will take very little time compared to the one we just witnessed yeah that that was a long yeah. one uh page i mean i just don't know i don't know who was up first but i noticed when i joined the meeting that that the missed the museum people were already there they were up on the screen so if you wouldn't mind i think we really should go to them first oh please do we just didn't know how one raises a hand and when so we're very happy to wait all right well i'm, I'm glad you did raise your hand because now we know you're waiting patient thank you <laughs> um greg yeah. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Fettis with Fettis Engineering, Mystic, uh, Connecticut, uh, professional engineer licensed in the state of Connecticut, representing the Mystic uh, Museum of Art. Um, with us tonight is uh, Susan Fisher and Rodolfo Reyes. Um, and I'm going to share my screen, but what we're proposing is a parking automation system. Um, and the bulk of the project is the reconfiguration of kind of the entrance to the parking lot off of Water Street. So if I can share my screen, I will. Uh... Uh, so this is the entire parking lot. Um, so this dashed rectangle is the area of kind of a Kind of what's visible directly from Water Street. I know. I think historically the parking lot itself was considered public, and kind of anything that happens in there gets gets viewed, can be viewed by the by the public. So, but the bulk of the work is in this rectangle. So when we have a blow up on page two, which I'm going to flip to, um, uh, so we're actually uh, it's Water Street to the top of the screen here. Uh, the sidewalk along Water Street is going to remain as is. Uh, we are widening the entrance approximately two feet to make it 24 feet wide, which is kind of the standard two-way aisle width. Um, 
which will help a little bit with uh, emergency vehicles getting in and out. Uh, we're removing the kiosk uh, that's currently there. Um, and I'm gonna blow this up just a little bit more. Um, so that kiosk is shown here, the kind of oddly shaped island and kind of uh, not from a traffic standpoint, from a circulation standpoint, it's kind of at an, at an odd angle. And uh, you can tell that by the number of times the, uh, the kiosk has been hit um, and more recently a couple times. Um, but that kiosk is getting removed and it's gonna be placed over by the existing restroom and police station building. Um, and we're gonna, it, you know, it's a nice looking little kiosk. Uh, we're gonna use it for storage of, uh, you know, the, the lot full sign, um, maybe some uh, traffic cones and so forth. Uh, so they can just be placed in there uh, and then just brought out um, when the lot is full. Um, so what we're proposing is a, a, a small two foot wide island, which will allow 11 foot clear on both sides uh, for in and out uh, gates, exit gate, entrance gate. Um, the little kiosks where you uh, would put your, I guess you grab a, a you grab a card here as you do today. Uh, everything kind of got straightened out, so you're you're pulling straight in. You're not making kind of an odd turn to get to the to get to the uh, kiosk, um, and you're continuing uh, once you get your ticket. The, uh, the, the kia or the gate will open. You'll come to a stop sign. Uh, you'll be able to make a left or a right, a right to go to the south entrance and a left to go to the, um, well, actually it'd be across and to the left, and then you'd have to make a right. Uh, one of the big changes uh, um, that we have is that two-way aisleway will become uh, one way. Uh, one would be an exit and the other one would be a straight through to the south parking lot or a left turn to return back to the um, uh, main parking lot. So those are the, the, the big changes um, to the circulation. It, probably people that have used this uh, when you're uh, currently, you get a left-hand maneuver coming out of the south parking lot, trying to get to the kiosk. And you can see the kiosk is uh, one, it's not perpendicular, um, so you're kind of, and then you're trying to merge to traffic, which is the main, the main traffic is coming in the exit only lane um, to get to that kiosk currently. Uh, so you get a car parked across here, you get cars coming in trying to make a left, and, and we've had uh, some serious gridlock in that, uh, in that area. Um, so since we're doing the automation, we decided to try to fix this this um, intersection and make it work a little bit better. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. Just just one thing. Also, we're we're we are moving this curb line over about two feet. Uh, so you, that's a landscaped island with the sign and so forth. None of that's changing. Uh, there will be just a little bit of, and I have a picture on the last sheet, a uh, little bit of landscaping that will come out of here um, to put in the new curbing and the new pavement. Again, it's only two feet or less. Um, so that'll just get replanted in the existing island. And I'll show a picture of that on the next sheet. Uh, let's go right to that since we're kind of talking. So this is the existing island. Um, again, so this, there's a mixture of stone and, and curbing along here. Uh, that'll get replaced with the curbing for the entire length. And again, it'll just widen it by approximately two feet or less. So any landscaping right on that edge uh, we'll just get dug up and shifted over uh, just enough to fit within the curbing. Um, and if there's not enough room for something, it'll get placed somewhere in that island. 
Uh, and we have a note to that effect, both on the site plan as well as this detail. Um, so kind of if you've been to, I don't know where they all are, but I know I've seen them in West Hartford, um, little pay at the kiosk thing. So you take your, your uh, ticket, you put it in there, you pay there, you get in your car, you drive out, a camera recognizes your license plate and says that you've paid and the gate goes up and you leave uh, the facility. Um, so that pay at the kiosk is gonna be located, there's gonna be one located here, uh, which is uh, basically right adjacent. So you're either walking from Water Street or walking uh, maybe the back of Pizzetta or Sift, uh, you pay at the kiosk uh, and you go to your car. There's also another one uh, located. Um, let me just flip to that real quick here. Yeah, there's another pay at the kiosk uh, located at the other end of the uh, uh, the other end of the uh, parking area, parking lot. So that's what uh, that'll look like. It'll be uh, gray. Um, and then additionally, uh, the gate access are uh, shown here. They're straight arms, so they go up, uh, not blocking. Originally, we had an articulating one. Uh, this allows a full height for uh, emergency vehicles. Uh, the islands are just going to be uh, concrete and concrete curbing. Um, well, there'll be no plantings. One, the, the one island in the front with the gates is only two feet wide. Uh, so really not, uh, would not condone uh, any kind of landscaping. Uh, the other island. Uh, let's see. This is a uh, going to be a concrete island so the shape of it is uh it's pretty narrow at the end but it's basically there to one keep people from making a left to go to leave and then uh to kind of direct people coming from the uh the exit only lane uh to get through um that's also going to have uh, mountable curbing for emergency vehicles uh the rest of this is Striping, uh, we chose to kind of leave the existing sidewalk in place, uh, kind of fill, uh, funnel traffic uh, within the non-striped areas, but if an emergency vehicle had to come in, they could, uh, they'd have a little bit more room to, to make the turn. Uh, similarly, uh, on the exit only, uh, we're leaving the existing curb, leaving the existing sidewalk, and we'll just be striping a portion of this so emergency vehicles, again, will have more room uh, to get out. And additionally, we are uh, widening here, uh, which will help. Because um, right now, I believe it's 22-ish feet wide. What's the, uh, the dark hatches? Uh, if you go back to the previous. So this shaded area is the area we are expanding the existing bituminous concrete uh, pavement uh, it's just shaded to show that's kind of what we're doing yeah but further if you go further down that the dark i think it's a crosswalk this is a crosswalk coming i think there's one there now but we'll be re-striping that basically gets you from i guess it's it's the Pizzetta corner um, across over to, it basically does that now, gets get you to this hatched fire lane area, which would then get you to the front entrance of the uh, Mystic Museum of Art. If somebody's coming from the left, how do they get out? Get the circle. So they would, the um, I'm gonna show you here, then I'm gonna go to the overall one, but they would come here to a stop sign, they would make a right um, and then they'd make a right here and then swing around 
and exit this way. You can okay. follow my cursor. Um, you know, we, we've we looked at many different scenarios. Uh, currently, now you can just make a left. It's an awkward left and it causes gridlock. Um, and, you know, people aren't always letting people in. Uh, you get a couple cars here and all of a sudden, you know, you got a car parked across here and then you got cars backing up coming in. That's the problem we've had. So we looked at many different scenarios to try to control traffic. Um, and, uh, you know, most people tend to go to this area to park, uh, but you obviously, when this gets full, people do come over here, a uh, little bit of a learning curve, um, but it's, it's not that bad of a maneuver. You'd come in, you'd stop, you'd make a right, you'd make a left, and you'd, you'd come to this stop sign and you'd circle back around and exit. Um, any of the other commission members have any questions? I, just have, I know uh, there's going to, for from a learning curve point of view, there's going to be obviously a lot of signage that's going to be needed. But I was just curious, what's a stop bar, Greg? It's just the white the white bar you see at, at stop signs on roadways. Painted, it's just a painted painted stripe, okay. typically 24 inches. You it just it's a it's another thing that says, hey, stop here. Okay. And right now it's pretty wide open through that whole area. There's not, you know, there's not a lot of traffic control. Um, and that uh I know this this has been like a two-way main aisle way to get right. kind of to this parking area and and further to the you know further to the I guess it would be the northeast um but it also you know when when people aren't uh inhibited I guess they tend to go a little faster um so we think not only is it going to solve our gridlock problems? We're going to slow traffic down a, a little bit. Uh, there's no reason to speed in, in a small parking lot like this. And I think that uh, changing this portion of it to one way will eliminate some of the kind of speeding through here to get down to this other area. Are you planning on uh, painting the arrows on the pavement of the parking lot? Uh, we, we are. Um, you know, some of them we showed you know, we're definitely going to be painting the ones and painting in this area. Um, you know, the other ones, we're going to see where we need them. But uh, th this really was to show traffic patterns that there's two way traffic through here. Um, I believe this was just changed to one way traffic around here at some point in the recent future. Um, and that's helped. I think they added some signage down here. Uh, we're not proposing to make any changes down in this area, um, as well as the south parking lot. Okay, and you, you have all a list of your materials and everything. It's you know. Yeah, I think so. Really, it's just the detail. Uh, you know, the details of uh, the gates. Um, there was a request so we're going to add to the plan. I'm just gonna show you. So this is the camera. We'll add, we're gonna add that to that third sheet also. This shows it being mounted to like the ceiling of a parking garage. Ours are gonna be mounted on a um, on a pole because we don't have a garage or we don't have a, a wall per se. Um, but basically, yeah. And that you haven't, I haven't, this is going to be added to the plan. We'll show this camera on a pole. And basically, it's about 25 feet, I think, from the back, back of the car when it reads it at a certain angle, reads the license plate, and, and then it uh, allows the car to go through. It says that it's paid. Any additional lighting going up or anything? Uh, there's not any additional lighting. Um, if they're Susan, you can confirm that that I don't we didn't talk about any additional lighting 
for talking about that as part of a separate project. Okay. But the lighting for this, for the if what you're referring to is the license plate recognition system. There's a lot of light that comes from the street level back through the entrance to the parking area. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? I mean, if, again, I just old habits die hard here in Mystic, and um, I would just really strongly encourage on that new keep going up right um, by the crosswalk. So if you go to now go down, down and out to the right, just on that stripe area, mm -hmm. I would really encourage signage to say do not enter. Yeah, we, so we have a proposed do not enter sign here. Okay, okay, I, can, I couldn't read um, so. Yeah, we do have some, uh, you know, stop sign, exit only sign, uh, proposed exit only lane sign. Um, and I think it's going to be, I want to say it's a little bit of a learning curve. Yeah. You know, we're going to get this thing up and running. I, I'd like to say it'd be perfect, but, you know, it's going to be a, a little bit of a learning curve. And I think we're going to, you know, made at the tweak of an arrow or a sign here or there. Um, but we tried to get, you know, the fire lane signs were asked for by the uh, by the fire department. Um, let me see, we have, yeah, so we have a stop bar sign here, another do not enter sign here coming back this way, um, right turn only, uh, which is here, stop and right turn only at this point. So we tried to cover most of the bases, but again, the, you know, we're, you know, this is, this is a big change for the parking lot in downtown Mystic. And uh, we think it's going to be much better. I think automated. it looks a lot better. Thank you. I just worry about Rodolfo losing two feet of plant area. That's my only concern. <laughs> I'm sure he'll find another area. If, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, after standing there for six years, walking up and down this parking lot um, and working on this with multiple people, this is a safer solution. Uh, you got a lot of crazy things happening in the summer, and this is definitely going to prevent the headaches for a lot of people. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> have you filed your application? Or are you going to file it? I'm going to file it tomorrow. Okay. Yep. All right, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You're, you're, you're welcome to continue with the next applicant if you would like. Them. Come on, Todd, get back to work. All right, all right. Um, Paige Gulrick, um, you're on. Um, are you there? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to share a screen. It's not something I'm doing often, but here we are. Very good. So it worked. Oh, yay, I'm pleased. Mark is with me. We're both architects with about 40 years of experience each. Um, um, young, not young people moving to uh, the area. We've fallen in love with Mystic and we've bought this wonderful house that many of you may know. It is right at the corner. I, I don't know if my cursor works or not. Um, we can yeah, see it. it is. We can see it. Okay, well, I'm not seeing it, but where there's a pink dot on the upper left Groton GIS map, you can see that um, our house is located at the corner of New London and High Street. So we're thrilled to be within just a couple of blocks of town. Um, and the house was built in 1809 and it is in an R7 district and um, it has had a lot of deferred maintenance and it's on a very open exposed site where there are um, four stop signs at the intersection that's just in front of or, or just northeast of the property. Um, this is just to orient you and I'm going to come back to this drawing in a moment, but just to see that you know where we are and to familiarize all of you with the property. 
this is the inner so are you seeing my cursor now yes yeah. yeah okay so this is the intersection of high street running north and south and new london and it drops steeply down the hill and ends up near the property we were just talking about and we're just a one block south of the baptist church so you you may have seen this it's a it's a large, uh, very simple colonial home with an addition that was done not long after the original home in 1809 for Edward Packer, who's the son of the famous Daniel Packer. So, um, and it's quite open and exposed. For some reason, there's very there's one tree on the site that the previous owner planted and a few arborvitae, arborvitae at one edge, but it's very open and a bit raw. Um, and these are, um, historic photos that we were able to get from the Seaport Museum. And they show this is the house here on the upper left. And the house is actually on the street. There is a three foot wide patch of earth where we'd like to do a little planting, but that belongs to the town. We just want to do that to buffer it. But the, the facade is on the street. So as you can see, not long after it was built, there was a fence put that ran into the north edge of the house here and the south edge of the house here. And then it comes along and, and really enclose the entire property right on the property line, making it a little bit less um, public. There's a lot of parking. There are five cars that park just north of the site right now. Um, and so I'm gonna continue on to the next, um, I actually I'll go back for a moment and just tell you a, a quick summary of what we'd like to do. We really see ourselves as custodians of this house. It's a wonderful old house with fantastic bones and it has almost a shaker um, feeling in that it's very simple and honest and straightforward inside. And we, we, we love the simplicity of the house. There's, there's not a great deal of ornament and it's, it's um, beautifully built, but in need of lots of TLC. One of the major issues that we've encountered is that there's no sheathing on the house. And I have been practicing and doing single family homes for 35 years, and I've never heard of a house with no sheathing. So um, the clapboard was so substantial that it actually was laterally tying the post and beam structure together. And when we removed one cabinet that had been added inside in a corner that was not of the period, we looked out to the street from the bedroom. I thought, oh, hello, there's, there's the pavement right there. It was a little shocking. So it, and the house is not insulated. So our first uh, um, issue is really to reclad the house. And we'd like to do it in a cedar clapboard. So it's very much in keeping with what's there. And we'd like to stain that clapboard. We, we have a color in mind and we'd like to, um, as, as one often sees with architecture of this sort and in some images I'll share with you, that it is um, all one color. So we'd like to make the trim and the um, window mullions and the frames, everything all one color, um, very sort of subtle and quiet. Um, we have a few minor door and window changes to make. The house, um, when the addition was made, they added some doors. The house has five entry doors. And it's, it's a little bit much. And some of them, as we'll see when I show you the exterior elevations, are oddly placed and, and um, a little bit chaotic. And we'd like to simplify the facade, making some areas just more improving the proportions and going back to what might have been built there had it not been joining of two structures the way it was done. Um, we would like to relocate the driveway. We now have five cars that park here along the north. And the driveway, as you'll see in one of our facade photos, comes right up in front of the house. This is the existing drive here, and it's a gravel drive, and we'd like to shift it away from the front of the house to soften this area a bit. Um, uh, the next area is that we would like to add a garage or barn. And if I go back to the previous image, you'll see that they had a barn similar in scale to what we'd like to do, but it was parallel to the house and we'd like to make it perpendicular to the north in this location here with the footprint running parallel to the main house and a, just north of the addition in order to buffer this a little bit because there's a great deal of traffic on this road. 
unfortunately, because there was so much construction up by the corner on the Baptist church, traffic diverted for a long time to New London. And I think a lot of people still take that path. So it's, it's pretty busy out and, here. And they don't necessarily stop. Yeah, they don't stop <laughs> at the stop signs, which we, we don't have small children right now. We could have grandchildren here in you know, a decade or so, but we just, we wish we could get people to stop at the stop signs. I'm sure that's a, a village-wide issue. Um, just to go back to my list for a moment, the other issues are um, we would like to put solar panels on the south facing. So this is the existing L-shaped house, which is about 1,400 square feet. The site um, is um, 16,000 square feet, just under uh, 0.48 of an acre. And the garage we're proposing has a roof of 1,200 square feet, but there's an opening through it to soften it and to create views of a garden in here. So it's 900 square feet enclosed. And um, we have sort of carriage house type doors here. And we're also going to be planting something, either a hedge or more arborvitae or something along here to soften it and screen it. Even though the garage will have nice carriage house doors, we'd like to buffer this a little bit here so we don't see so much parking and so that it doesn't feel like a big garage at that edge. I, I think the only other point there, sorry, I meant to read this, is that we'd like to add a stone wall. We actually worry a little bit about someone driving into the house. Um, it's very strange. I, I have moved here after three decades in New York and I stand in the kitchen and someone walks by and they are about 15 inches from me and they'll stop and have a conversation. And several times I thought someone was in the house. And one day the UPS truck parked out just outside the kitchen and it was literally about 18 inches from the house. And I walked into the kitchen and I thought, why is it so dark in here? <laughs> and it's, it's a very strange thing, even though I'm somewhat urban, I've never lived this close. It's, it's, it's a bit jarring to, and we've studied the Sanborn maps and we, you know, we're both architects and urban designers and very interested in the fabric of a town. We care deeply about all of the issues about community. And there are only a couple of other houses where it, actually the street is here. And interestingly enough, if you look at these photos, we thought, well, the street must have gotten wider, but this, the cow path or carriage path was actually right at the street originally, which is a, a bit unusual, I think. So just to take you through the next steps, this is the existing condition of the house. It has had a great deal of deferred maintenance. Um, just for example, um, I don't know if I can zoom in for everyone here, but at this point on the house, the boards are very bowed and we believe the clapboard was redone at some point and there are areas where it was patched, but this is where I can see out to the street from in here. Um, we've just done some interior plaster work. We're being cautious about how much we're doing because we know that there's a lot to do when we reclad. So, so we love the bones. Um, I will share the few window and door changes that we'd like to make, which are minor. Um, this is looking at the um, east facade of the main house and the north wing. And these are three of the five entry doors. Um, the house actually has a small apartment up here. So it's actually 5153 High Street. And we will keep this entrance, but this one is a little peculiar and the facade is a, a bit unfortunate. So we'd like to put a double hung window, single pane. We'll do wood storm windows because we love the single pane, even though we know that there's a great deal of infiltration. They're just beautiful and the sight lines are so narrow and precious that we'll put in another window to match the existing and we want to add one more window which we'll take from another facade of the house. On the um, side of the house that faces sort of inward that's a bit more protected facing the the yard at the west we would like to, to you reuse these two windows on other parts of the house and put in a there's already a door here we'd like to put we're just going to shift it and put in more windows. This is not very visible from the street. You get a glimpse of it for a moment if you're coming down from 
the hill coming down the hill on New London, but that will be blocked if we build the garage. And, and we'd like to build a little porch out here because this is the door to nowhere right now. This is the break your leg door if you step out here. Um, this is just a bit about, we are thinking of a dark gray color and these are just some precedents. This house looks very much like ours from the South. And these are all colonial style homes that we found engaging and we'd like, some of these are a bit darker, but we'd like to go sort of a charcoal gray on all of the elements of the house. And then the, I'm sort of running through this because I don't, this is our first preliminary meeting and I don't want to take too much of your time, but this is a picture of the house and the same view if we were to build this three car garage that's the length of a four car garage, but with a big opening. So the garden is connected to the front and, and we'll be, have a potting shed and do things out here to soften it. Um, and then this is a view from the, if you were flying in a little helicopter or something, we got these two views from the real estate agent. We, we just bought the house in September. But if you were coming down New London, I guess in a helicopter, it would look like this or a drone. And this is that view with the garage here and, and a bit of a elevated porch. Um, pretty small and not, not far above grade. It's just three steps above grade. We have spoken with and have met with several times country carpenters up in Hebron, Connecticut, about doing a post and beam structure that's very much in keeping with the style of the house. And this is a, a three car garage with a walkway through it an open bay. And that's not exactly, but very much just the direction we would like to pursue. And then there'll be a lot of plantings to soften and screen this. And we have a, a carriage house door that has applied wood um, members on it to soften that a bit. And these are the types of low stone walls that we've seen in the area that we really like that are appear to be dry laid, but have a little bit wet laid um, material inside just to keep them from toppling over. That would only be 18 or 20 inches tall and, and quite narrow. Um, we would like to consider putting, and I'm going to go right back to the first view, solar panels on the south side of the garage roof. We're just trying to cut energy consumption as much as possible. We feel in our profession it's essential to be responsible and do that, and that would be the least visible area. We would not do that to a, to a building of this area. Again, we feel like the custodians or caretakers of this building that will long outlive us. And we feel that's not appropriate to put them on the house. So we would propose that we put them on the south facing part of the garage. Um, so I've done a lot of talking, Mark, do you want to add no, anything? No, it's all good, yeah. So the, again, this is, we've only been in the area for a few months. This is what we do and love all day. And now we have an opportunity to do it here and we'd like to, get a sense from you of, of your feelings about what we're proposing. And thank you. Thank you. So I want to say personally, I'm a very, I'm very impressed by your presentation. Um, I live in a 1740 colonial. So I, uh, <laughs> a lot of your comments of lack of insulation and such uh, really hit home. Um, you guys have done your research, the historical pictures show the fence you want to put up. Um, you know, the barn, there's a historical, tie in there um you know somewhere thing i put solar in my house i put it on the well, the garage is built in the 1940s for the same reason and you, know, you said a word that really hit home is that you're stewards of that house it's kind of the word i use with my house we just kind of preserve them for the next generation so personally i'm a big fan of everything you uh you um proposed tonight thank you too thank you. very nice we thought we might call a garage epi Oh, we were tempted to call it the EPI because we love the DPI. <laughs> and this is Edward, Captain Edward Packer's house, and he was Daniel Packer's son. So that's a bit of trivia, but we're we're so moved by this. And we we both tend to do things that are not quite as traditional in our own professions. And we learn from the house every day. So it's a great privilege to 
to have this house. We were shocked when we found it has no sheet. We never even heard of a house without sheathing before. <laughs> have you looked into uh, solar uh, roof shingles? As we, have. To we have. We have. We have. We're still researching that. Um, it's interesting. There's a lot of panels out there. We we think the aesthetics is important, so we might sacrifice um, efficiency for aesthetics but we're still in the process of researching what's out there. We know that uh, we've, I'm doing a number of passive houses right now and know that the technology is uh, really aesthetic. Shingles is really not there yet. Tesla's not there yet, even though they've been talking about it for a number of years. So we're still researching that. And Mark is working with a company that's doing solar shingles and has completed a couple of buildings in Groton. He was practicing in Milwaukee for many years yeah. and he, he has worked with them and they're in the forefront of doing solar shingles. And they do have a track record because some of their buildings locally here have been up for a while now. But we're still being a little cautious about whether or not they've they've solved all the problems. I, I agree with John. I think you've done a very nice job. The only thing I didn't particularly care for was those four windows on the west side in a row together next to that move door? But you don't. You said you don't see it so much from the. Really won't see it. If the garage is here, I, I think that because they're right here, um, you won't see them. And in areas, the house is a little dark. And because we're thinking of this, because the house is so public, because there's no landscaping, uh, we we thought maybe we would make this feel a little more private in here, provide a bit of a view to it, but that's so linear and you come down here, we think there's no chance that you're going to see it. This is a huge row of arborvitae. Um, Can you put in some like double French doors or something? Well, we're, well, thinking, there's we're, a, we're thinking about putting our kitchen in that spot. Oh. So that's why the so those are we'll put in one French door, true divided, but but above that, there's a counter below it. So that's where there will be um, either double hung or casement that look just like the double hung with the same division and proportion. So they're sitting on top of the counter, basically. Yes. yes. Yeah. I just don't like the four in a row. It, it yeah. just doesn't appeal to me. But yeah. sure. that was my only comment on the whole presentation. Everything else was spot on and beautiful, but the four in a row just looked funky. Well, we'll look at that, and it's possible that we might have just three, and we might uh, let allow some facade between them so they feel more. So it's not entirely new, but it's more in keeping with what's here. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You live in a house like this. Every every window is a punched window. And but here we have an opportunity to kind of look out onto this landscape, so it's interesting. Yeah, and I, I really, I really don't think it'll be all that noticeable. You also should no, know that we, we it, get... it'd be fine. I just don't, I don't pretend. I get it. For it. No, and it's good to know your opinion. It's helpful. And, and, and we have no jurisdiction over the color of your house, so you can do whatever you want. <laughs> we, we, I, I lived, I went to high school in Boston, uh, north of Boston, in Topsfield, and there's the Parson Capen House, which was kind of that witch house. <laughs> so, and was it gray? It was very gray. Oh. Yes. Well, we will not have a witch house. <laughs> and, and, and of course, obviously, we'd like to see an elevation from, um, you know, from the, is that New London Road, just of the garage doors and the, you know, the cutout. And, uh, yes. You, you know, just something a little bit more realistic. I think, I think it'll be fine. And, you know, I've driven by that house 10,000 times. And, um, I've always thought it was a little odd, and I always thought the the yard just looked well, quite vacant. Yeah. You know I mean? We're hoping the garage will really define the exterior of this space in a way that it doesn't define it all today. Yeah, I think. And we right. not only like plantings out, you know, buffering this area. This is not shown on our site by any means, but also some plantings in here to soften it and to to really feel. You know, we wondered why do other properties have some nice mature plantings? Why are there no trees on our property really at all? It feels so vacant. And, and so we hope to, um, uh, in our initial um, drawing, we also talked about, and I didn't mention landscape. I've somehow lost a tree. There were six birch trees out here. And we, we just think softening this and making it 
welcoming and making the landscape um, more gentle and less um, bare than it is will be very welcome at that intersection. Yeah, I agree. Maybe it's rocky and it doesn't grow well. It, it could be. It could, could be. be. Could be. Yeah. There's part, of, a, part of the house has a crawl space underneath. I think they hit rock. Yeah, the house has some point. full basement only in a limited area. So. So is there anything you would recommend? We, we so appreciate your comments. We would like to definitely be on the agenda. We, we hope to, um, we don't dare pull the plug on getting the garage going until we know that we have approval on it and we'd love to build it in the spring, but we won't proceed until we know both from the historic district and the zoning board that everything is approved so so we would like to be on the agenda in two weeks and we're not quite sure what we do now to officially do so well you you um you have to fill out an application and, you, and you've got to file that application um with uh, the town no later than thursday morning i believe to be on okay. the agenda for the week uh, the meeting two weeks uh, well, that's coming up yeah <laughs> and 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 you've got to submit all of your exhibits I mean, you would have to talk to Tom Zanarini. Um, yes. Who oversees it in terms of the exact timing on the exhibits. I think it's that we have a little bit more time than we used to have, but not too much. So, because everything's got to be published um, for public view um, prior to the meeting. And it's some days prior. I mean, the actual newspaper notice goes out, uh, gets placed, I guess, or filed in on, next, on this coming Thursday. So you've got to have all that. You want to have, um, I think you've got pretty much pretty much all the photographs you're going to need. Maybe a, a photograph or two of some of your abutting the abutting property owners um, okay. and the, the streetscape. So I would include that, and then you would need a a list of any and all materials that you're going to use. And if there are any um, replacement windows, we need the specs on those windows um, mm. and and the, and the architectural cuts and that kind of thing. And uh, and you know the type of siding that you're going to use. I guess you're going to use. Uh, Clabbered, cedar clabbered. Um, if it's if it's identical in terms of inches to the weather and whatever, you can just state that on your plan, um, so we know what the the spacing is. And I assume what you're going to do is you're going to strip all the existing clabbered off and sheathe the house, and then put the yes. clabbered on top. Yes, we'll insulate. We'll strip it off. We will insulate between the post and beam, hoping that a lot of the interior plaster survives this process. And um, then she, then membrane and, and cedar clapboard. So it's interesting the clapboard now it's, it varies from four inch to five and a half inches. And we're going to go four inch exposure. I think everywhere. It's just, so it's all, it's all the same. And I guess, yeah. are you going to, you plan to use fiberglass bats or are you going to foam it or what are you going to do? I no, think, probably think, rock wool because rock it's wool. rock wool is good for moisture, fire, acoustics. Yeah. Um, probably rock wool. Not a big fan of foam. Yeah, we 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 are forced to use foam as professionals. You know, there's some, we're having to build new buildings and renovate in in a way that's so tight that you make a building so it can't breathe, and then you have to put in a system so that yep. when you have the doors and windows closed, you get some air in so people don't suffocate in the houses and although we have to comply with that in many ways we like a house that breathes quite frankly yeah, so. it's important that the wood breathes and i think that's why it failed yeah. they, they it just couldn't breathe yeah and would you suggest we add in addition to what you've recommended which was very helpful should we should we show all exterior elevations with two buildings yeah, yeah. okay Good. all of them okay I mean, existing right. and the new. Okay. Wonderful. Do you have any other questions? No, I think we're good. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. That's a very, very good presentation. And we look forward to meeting all of you at some point. Yeah, Beyond right. our own project, we're just committed to the area. So thank yeah, you. And not, and, and not on a video screen, you mean? Right. No, right. no, no. One maybe, day. Maybe someday. <laughs> We used to meet in person. It was so long ago. I, I don't it believe it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank nice you. job. Nice Bye -bye. job. So, anyone else, Peter? Should we leave? Yeah, you can leave. You can leave. You can stick around if you want.
Um, are we, is that all the potential free apps we've got, Peter? I don't see anyone else out there now. And I thought this was going to be a quick meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any public communications? I hope not. <laughs> no, nothing to report. All right, approval of the minutes. Uh, actually, I don't know if this, it, sorry, Todd, if this wasn't public communications, uh, Alice Foley reached out to me. Is that new business or public communications? Who reached so, out? Probably new, probably new business. The business, okay, I'll hold off. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 18th? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay, we'll take a roll call. Uh, Don? Approve. Bonnie? Yes. Bill? Yes. Uh, Todd? Yes. And John? Are you yes. sitting, John? Yeah, okay. That's right, you, you said it for Sarah. Okay, old business? Any old business? No. New business? I guess we'll hold off on election of the officers as we are wont to do. and. Uh, you have something you want to bring up, John? Yeah, so um, Alice Foley on 7 Park Place reached out to myself and the council person Westervelt. Um, she feels that there's a lot of encroachment on town right-of-way property by her neighbors with no permits. I don't know if that falls under our purview. I, I know. I brought uh, this up about, a, I don't know, whatever, two months ago, because she called me. And I told her that it isn't, the purview of the historic district. Okay. I, I, I know we, council person we Westerville did discuss it. It is part of the town council's purview. Yeah, that we did discuss that before. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Any other new business? Uh, the only other issue is next month, we are, I mean, next month, next meeting where you're going to have, uh, remember the chain link fence issue that came up at the beginning of January, we brought it for discussion. Yes that's going to be coming back so uh the neighbor wants to she's submitting a couple pictures showing it from the road that shows that it is visible from the road even the, even in the back fence but tom's been out he had a surgery he's been out of the office for two weeks so i gotta get back to him and find out exactly what's where we're at with it okay but i held her off on this meeting to go to the next meeting so she's going to be coming in at the next meeting hey i just wanted to mention uh, also for new business um all the Pearl Street fence issue came up. You know, the house on Pearl, I don't know if it's three or, I uh, forget. Um, it's a co concrete stucco house that sold recently. They just put up a new, and it's PVC uh, fence. And I don't believe they came to the commission. So I don't, I don't know, maybe somebody could look into whether they uh, approval or not. Maybe I wasn't at a meeting. Do you know the address? What was the address exactly? I have to look it up and give it to you. I, I can't remember. Okay, yeah, throw me an email. I'll give you a call. It's yeah. like probably five or something like that. It's it's a stucco house, two family. Okay. It's a single family, but sort of has an apartment. <laughs> All right, well, we will have to have the right address, I guess, to investigate that, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to everybody. Okay. Um, Max brought up a good point earlier about the recording. How do we access this recording? To Go to town meetings, and uh, they have all the meetings logged in there. Okay. Yeah, it's on the town webpage. Town webpage, okay, thank you. Pretty easy. Yeah, can you send that out, though? Just to, I don't, I'm, I don't know. Just to make it a little easier to <laughs> us, yeah. Just right here, this web page right here, grottenct.gov. Yeah, the, the Stucco here. House is Eight Pearl Street, by the way. Go around right the government eight. and get in the meeting calendars. Eight. Thank you, John. Welcome. It's Eight Pearl. And then you can do a search engine down here, and you can go through and check out all the different meetings. Okay, I'm just all up. My point was that uh, I think that the one that was presented today probably needs another look before they uh, come forth again. I don't, I don't know if they're planning on coming for the next meeting or not, but uh, I just think it's a lot to take in all in one meeting. And if we want to 
uh, go through it with as much scrutiny as we do, as we do, you know, for, you know, someone's fence going in for a project of that size. I think it's worth uh, everybody on the team taking a look ahead of time, not just uh, seeing it during the meeting, not that that's what anyone does, but uh, just want to make sure uh, everybody gets the same, the same view. Well, there's nothing saying you have to approve it that same night. <laughs> I know, but there was a lot. That... It was like when Todd presented the, the place on Water Street, it was a big presentation for a preliminary. And I get what you're saying, Max, I think. But just sending Sarah and uh, who's missing, whoever was missing, Eric. an email saying, please, if you can take a look at the video of the preliminary would be a good idea yeah for sure yeah i don't know is there any way we can force people to break their presentations apart a little bit to make it so it's not such a big chunk all at once well that wouldn't be the that wouldn't be the method of most historic district commissions but i but i do think it's incumbent on everyone if, if they have a chance to go through the the presentation or the drawings before the meeting. I think it makes it, I mean, some of us can grasp some of this stuff more easily than others. And um, and so, you know, let's face it, if you sit there and stare at some drawings for a while, you pick up a lot of things that you might not otherwise pick up. But I don't know about intentionally splitting up a presentation because what, what how are you splitting it up, you know? I mean, no, I mean, it, it just makes for a, a long thing, but it, I don't think you're splitting up, it's a good idea. No, I think I think uh, you know the onus might be on us to uh, kind of take the extra time for these bigger things. And I know for Todd's presentation, I was out. I think um, it was when my son was born. Um, may, you know, I I've never uh, spent a lot of time ahead of any of these meetings, really digging through any of the material ahead of time. Certainly, I've never seen a uh, a recorded. Uh, um, preliminary hearing of anything. Um, but I think in some cases where there are significant pro projects, it might be in our best interest to, to take That's an extra. Idea. Yeah. What'd you say, Bonnie? I think it's a good idea. If anybody is coming as a new presentation, the member, the the panelists, us, should get a copy just to make it easy for us because we may not know if there was to go on the site and look any of the cases that come that had prelims, it might be good to have that included when they do their presentation. It's more info on the project. I just think that we should uh, take the time to look at it ahead of time. Um, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And, and I also think that you know, we could do each other only, uh, a service too. This is after tonight, having seen that extended presentation, um, as Bonnie pointed out, probably a good idea to tell Eric and, um, and Sarah that they should, that there was a big presentation and they should familiarize themselves with it. So, because I think, I, my guess is these guys are going to come back in two weeks. Yeah. It sounds like they want to go on Thursday, um, have everything in by Thursday for next following two Because Tuesday. obviously, you know, a lot of people are, you know, they get anxious to get going because they've got other approvals they've got to get. And, um, so, um, you know, maybe we talk to Tom and, and, and maybe Tom uh, could clue us in too when he's got a big, a big number of exhibits for a particular project. And maybe an email could go out and say, you know, you really ought to take a good look at this one. It's pretty big. Um, well, this was a preliminary that came in where we didn't even know they were coming in with it. Oh, uh, they just came in tonight. They showed right. up. Yeah, we don't even get any advance notice. Yeah, so right. Yeah, so when you think it's going to be a five-minute meeting, right? <laughs> you only <don't, you> <laughs> see one thing on the on the agenda, and you're like, <laughs> "My dinner's been simmering for two hours." <laughs> Well, so it wouldn't be unheard of to if you were to continue a meeting to the next meeting to have some time to review the material after the public hearing started. Yeah, and that's not uncommon for a board to do that. Yeah, the, the board can do can do that on its own, regardless right. of the intent of the applicant. Yeah. 
Can I make a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All right, we're adjourned. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Hey.